Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's Amp Repair Extravaganza featuring the contents of this very nicely wrapped box from Florida. Uh, let's open it up and see what our challenge will be for the next few days. Well, the owner warned me to be prepared for some unusual packing material and boy was he right. Uh, it appears to be Assurance Adult Diapers. Well, this is one of the few indignities I've been spared so far in my aging life. Um, but uh, you must admit, pretty snazzy and very effective as a packing material. So without further ado, let's don one of these beauties and get ready to witness the glory of what's inside this inner box. Then just when you thought it couldn't get any more bowel and bladder oriented, Look at the packing material at this end. Remember, like what, a year or so ago, this would have been worth more than the amplifier. So, uh, let's go ahead then and extract the inner box and see what it contains. I would be remiss if I were not to comment on the irony of the first three letters in the name of these adult uh, diapers. Surely that can't be a coincidence. We're finally down to the inner box and it's rather small actually for a complete amplifier and kind of unusually shaped. So I hope the suspense is building and that you didn't read the title of the video which of course gave it all away. So let's cut open the tape and see what's lurking within. We're currently enjoying a violent windstorm uh, which happens every spring here in the desert southwest. It's the price we pay, I guess, for the otherwise wonderful weather. So if you hear any roaring in the background, it's either my stomach trying to digest my lunch or the wind outside the window. Well, how about this for a very pleasant and uncommon surprise? A virtually mint 1946 Princeton Woody, the very first series of amps that were ever made by the Offender Electric Instrument Company and one of those this the holy grails for all Fender uh, amp enthusiasts I've never found one of these out in the wild uh, I've never been able to buy one or own one but I sure do enjoy working on them so let's take a look at what all came with it let's see a bunch of removed parts tubes, uh, a nice schematic, and then all sorts of literature from the amp's owner to help us in uh, sort of troubleshooting the amp and optimizing its performance and also learning a great deal about its history and development. Okay, so if that sounds interesting, let's get started. First, let's go over the letter that came with the amp and the story behind its acquisition I think is really interesting. Um, I'm not going to just read this to you. Um, what I'll do is go slowly over the letter. You can pause and um, the video and read it for yourself. I will hit a few highlights. Came from eBay. Unmolested. There are little decals, which we'll see in just a few minutes when we take a close look at the amp cabinet. They're with a sports motif from the Tip Top Bakery. And according to his homework, uh, that was in Australia of all places. Now he's already done a great deal of uh, part replacement and restuffing of electrolytics. He tells here in detail what he's done and all the old parts are in a plastic bag right here. A schematic, uh, the amp has no volume control or AC switch and we'll see why in just a few moments. Okay, someone had penciled in the tube locations. Tubes all checked out. Very quiet operation. It has a 6K6, but it should have a 6V6. We're going to find him a really nice, appropriate vintage tube for that purpose. Okay, and the, 
the enclosed packing material uh, will be helpful to me in the years to come. Hopefully quite a few years to come. Well, as I said, I have not uh, yet uh, succumbed to the indignity of having to wear uh, adult diapers, but I can always look forward to it in the future. Okay, so uh, that's it on our letter. Um, I think now we need to take a close look at the amp itself. Okay, I've laid it down so that we can get the best possible lighting. If this is original grill cloth, and it sure does look like it is, it is it's just stunningly nice. Um, the metal strips have the type of corrosion you would expect, I think, for its age. I remember 1946, so that's, what, 76 years old? Okay, we can look at the bottom. I swear these look like the original rubber feet. If you notice, there's a discoloration from the rubber on the wood. Uh, the bottom of the cabinet is perfect. There are some of those decals. I'll get you some close-up shots of those. They're really cute, very quaint. Okay, and we look at the graining on the side, which looks kind of like oak to me. Uh, as we'll see when I read some of the history of uh, these amplifiers, we'll see that different hardwoods were used. Let's look over here at the left-hand side, some more stickers. I can imagine some young fellow getting this amp. Uh, these were originally intended for steel guitar use, and he had these stickers. They probably came in like bubble gum or something like that and put them on the amp to kind of personalize it and make it his own. And they have aged tremendously uh, and I think really add to the quaintness, quaintness if there is such a word, of the amp itself. Um, no cigarette burns, so apparently these weren't from tobacco pouches. Let's close in on a couple of the stickers and see if we can't get a good look at them. Tip top. And we see a sports character engaged in some sort of nefarious activity. Let's look at the one on the back behind the handle. Now they're swimmers. I can recognize that. Tip top is better bread. Cute. Let's look at on the the side stickers, they didn't fare as well. Looks like we got a football player, basketball player, here's our baseball player, and last but not least, was that tennis? Pretty snazzy. Also, I've had time to sort of um, Ponder this fellow. I think he's a pole vaulter. Doesn't that look like a pole? And he's jumping over that rod right there. So anyway, magnificent cabinet. Absolutely firm, secure joints. Some scratches on it here and there that uh, would denote age. There's black spots. Now those of you who are white spot fanciers this is the ultimate okay when you see the little black spots like that this thing is absolutely at the top of its game little safety screws for the handle beautifully shaped handle okay uh, let's turn it around and take a look at the chassis and the speaker well we have an ancient 2R power cord with a add-on a plug and a wonderful sticker right here. It looks like City of LA approved. Okay, 29347. Probably before Underwriters Laboratories um, got the death grip on safety stickers. Heavily sort of rusted, patinaed chassis surface. Um, we see that the pencil markings that were referred to in the letter on the tube sockets, good stout looking 
transformer. I'm going to turn it around in a second and try to read that decal. And then our trusty 8 inch electrodynamic Jensen speaker. And if we look at the bottom, 220, 614. To me, the 220, of course, is Jensen, but 6 would be 1946, and probably the 14th week of that year. Here's the part numbers for the speaker. The cone appears to be in good shape. I don't see any glue patching on it. Wires look original. Got the output transformer piggybacked on the speaker basket. Good metal braces for the floor and I'm guessing probably for the top panel of the amp, which should make sense because the last thing you want is when you're picking up your mighty Princeton Woody uh, is to have the whole top and everything come off and have this go rolling down nine flights of stairs at the Waldorf Astoria. Looking at the staples, they don't look quite as rusty as you might expect, but I'll tell you, I don't know where you go to buy this type of cloth. Remember there in the uh, letter there was a comment about uh, some holes had been drilled on the back and there was an outlet back here like a power outlet to plug other things into and that was probably where the AC wire came through. Okay, the owner removed that, thank heavens. Um, okay, uh, let's go ahead and remove the chassis and take a look at the contents. You can tell this was early in the development of uh, Fender's uh, designs for chassis and overall amp construction. And rather than having the screws that go through like we have now, we've got a couple little angle bracket brackets with uh, round-headed wood screws holding the chassis in. Hopefully there's not one behind the power transformer. Uh, we'll have to check and see the first wood screws out and it's kind of interesting to look at first of all it was in there very snugly okay the wood is real tight around the screw threads notice how shiny and protected they are whereas the exposed head has succumbed to the same type of uh, atmospheric oxidation that the chassis has oh and there's another one of those decals I believe how cute now that I have the chassis out of the cabinet, I can get a really good look at the stamp on the power transformer, and it looks like PEPCO, P-E-P-C-O. Now, there is a modern company that makes large industrial transformers, and it may be the same company. This has just grown up over time. Also, in the 60s, I believe there was a Canadian company called PEPCO that made uh, guitar amplifiers. So who knows? Maybe all three are related. Regardless, uh, it's just fun to see all the details on this amp and record them uh, for those who are trying to restore similar amps or trying to verify the originality of their own. I've got the chassis flipped over so we can see the circuit. We see that one of the two wire power leads comes over here to a surface mount uh, fuse holder and according to the schematic this should be a two amp fuse. The other end of it goes here into the one of the primaries of the power transformer. The other wire comes here to what I'm assuming is an unused um, pin here on the tube socket and then that will be connected to the other primary. So there is no on off capability on this amp. You plug it in it's on. Um, also there is no volume control or tone control. Those would be on the lap steel guitar and apparently were not felt to be necessary on this little simple amplifier. We have the two input jacks. Uh, we'll check inside to see if there's a difference between which one you plug into. We see here in the schematic there is no difference. It shows both of the uh, input jacks are grounded that they will go through a 50,000 ohm resistor then through a 0.01 microfarad capacitor past a grid leak and into uh, the 
first triode here of the 6SL7. Now let's see how our amp uh, compares to that. First off, I only see one grounded input jack. See that both of them come here and go through. That is a 100K resistor and on the bottom another 100K resistor. So that's different. Uh, the schematic says 50,000 ohm and instead these are 100,000 ohm. They come together like a Y and feed into that first uh, triode grid. I see no 0.01 microfarad cap and I see no grid leak resistor uh, on that the two pin that corresponds to the grid of the first triode. So as you can see I've drawn a revised schematic here to show exactly how our amp circuit is wired uh, as opposed to uh, the way it was theoretically wired on the Princeton schematic. The next very obvious difference is that although the schematic says that our first preamp tube is a 6SL7 in reality it's a 6SJ7. So we're not going into the uh, grid of the first triode of a 6SL7 at all. We're going into the grid of a pentode 6SJ7. Now lest you think that somebody simply plugged an SJ7 tube into the 6SL7 socket, uh, that wouldn't work at all. Uh, the amp would not function. Um, and we know that this amp does function. So uh, apparently on the very early 1946 models they used a pentode for the first preamp tube and then in the later versions they went on to use the extra uh, components and a duo triode rather than a pentode as the first um, amplification tube. Because of the difference in our first uh, preamp tube uh, we're just going to ignore the schematic for this part of the circuit and uh, just start drawing our own here. So we have the input to the grid of the 6J7 pentode. We've already talked about that. Now um, we see here that the uh, cathode uh, is biased with a 1.5K resistor and is bypassed with a 25 at 25 bypass cap. Come over here we see the 1.5K bias resistor and we see the 25 at 25 bypass cap. Everything's fine at that point. Next we see that the B plus is going to come in here and go through 240K to the plate, 1 meg to the screen. Okay, here's our B plus coming in here. We've got one meg to the screen. We see that that resistors, yeah, that's close enough. Okay, that's that's pretty good. But over here we see body and dot two, four, ten k, two hundred and forty k, and we see that that resistor is reading four hundred and twenty k. So we're going to have to replace this resistor. Uh, before we continue. I found a nice NOS 220K resistor which is definitely close enough and it has that old look where it doesn't just stand out as being a replacement. So it's now in place so let's continue with our analysis of the circuit. Okay, I revised our diagram to show that that resistor is now 220K. Uh, next uh, the signal will be output from the 6J7 pentode from its plate uh, pin 8 through a 0.02 microfarad coupling cap to the 6V6 and we see down here is the 0.02 microfarad coupling cap. Now I'm just going to assume that that coupling cap's okay because I really can't test it properly until the circuit's operational. So uh, I'm going to leave it and we'll come back to it later. Now we're up here to what should be a 6V6. Now as you recall from the letter, uh, the amp came with a 6K6, which has a lower output. So uh, I'm going to go in and uh, get a satisfactory uh, 6V6 vintage tube out of my stash, and we will uh, plug it in and go from there. Well, I dug out a couple of nice vintage 6V6s. Uh, one is the uh, traditional RCA. The other, I just love, it's so quaint, a Marconi Radiotron. And looking at the two and with that red print, I have a 
feeling it could have been made by RCA also, but you could admit that's pretty snazzy. Okay, uh, I'll start out with the RCA and see if it sounds great, so much the better. If not, I'd like to try this one as a backup. Well, we've discussed just about all of the circuit except for the output section, which in the case of the schematic uh, is a 6V6 output tube. We know that our amp arrived with a 6K6 tube. Now, the uh, pins and internal construction are exactly the same. The tubes are directly interchangeable. Really, the only difference is that the 6V6 has a higher output than the 6K6. We see that the signal comes in from the preamp uh, section through a 0.01 microfarad coupling cap past a 1.5 mega ohm grid leak resistor uh, to the grid of the 6V6. Our cathode, which is pin 8, uh, was biased with a 250 ohm resistor in the circuit as we received it. But on the schematic, uh, they say 500 ohm, and I believe that that is correct. Um, a 250 ohm resistor would give uh, far too high plate current and plate dissipation. So I changed the circuit to 500 ohm resistor for bias, and it uh, remained bypassed with a 25 microfarad at 25 volt electrolytic capacitor. We'll see how that modification of BIOS resistor works for us when we test the tube BIOS with our Eurotubes probe. And finally the B plus voltage after being dropped by a 50K resistor is fed through pin 4 to the screen of the output tube. First off we see here the cathode BIOS resistor red, green and probably brown so that's going to be what 250 ohms um, and it measures at 313.3 so uh, we'll have to replace this then also uh, down here is the bypass cap for the 6v6 and it's 25 at 25 just like uh, it was for the uh, 6sj7 looking at the schematic we see that the cathode uh, bias resistor is supposed to be 500 ohms and uh, the bypass cap is supposed to be uh, 25 at 25 so uh, we're torn here between what's wired in the circuit which is uh, 250 ohms and what the schematic says which should be 500 ohms my experience is on 6v6's the 500 sounds better to me. Remember how on the champs and all they're um, biased at more like about 470, 480? 250 seems too low. I'm going to put in like a 470 to 500 in this place rather than just duplicate the 250 that's in. Now that I've removed that 250 ohm resistor, you can see the burned area at the center. It's gotten way too hot. I think it was flowing way too much current. I can't imagine what the bias was on the 6K6, uh, but uh, I think we'll be a lot better off with at least double this resistance uh, as our bias resistor. While I'm at it, I'm not real thrilled with the looks of this scruffy white 1.5 mag resistor. I'm going to replace it with something more period correct. Uh, I've got an NOS 1.5 mag uh, carbon comp I'm going to put in in its place. Since the smaller bias resistor showed uh, effects of so much heat, I put in a much higher wattage resistor here, and then here is the 1.5 meg uh, resistor to ground on the uh, input to the grid. So I think uh, not only uh, cosmetically, but functionally, we're in much better shape. Let's take a few moments out from today's repair project to open this gift box uh, from a viewer and friend named Michael at ShellyAmps at gmail.com. Uh, he's been kind enough to help me with the work overload on amp repairs lately. And on top of that, he also sent me a gift. So let's open this and see what it is. Well, it came with a nice letter. Apparently he bought this for himself, but uh, hasn't used it that much. So he thought maybe I would and uh, possibly feature it in a future video. 
Okay, so uh, without further ado, let's see what the gift is. It's beautifully packed, so I'm going to set the camera down, remove all of the bubble wrap, and we'll see what lurks within. Well, check this out. It's a Heathkit model IT28 high voltage capacitor tester. Now, I had one of these years ago and foolishly sold it, but this was for many years the acid test for capacitor leakage. It actually charges them up to their full operating um, voltage and then measures uh, tiny amounts of leakage if it is present. Now I'm going to have to uh, download the manual for this so that I know that I'm operating it correctly. We see the probes right here. But uh, once I master this device, I'm thinking it would be very useful uh, to make a video contrasting the accuracy and uh, efficacy of this type of high voltage capacitor tester compared to uh, an ESR meter and also to testing uh, the capacitors in circuit with one of the leads removed from the circuit. Okay, so there's three different methods that I'm aware of and uh, we can compare them and see uh, which is the best, which is the most accurate, uh, and which suits us uh, for our practical use. So if that sounds interesting, uh, keep an eye on future video releases, uh, and I hope to have a video uh, covering the three uh, capacitance testers in the near future. Well, I checked with the owner of the app, and he said that every single capacitor here that you see in the circuit has been restuffed with fresh, uh, brand new uh, capacitors, both electrolytic and nonpolar. So hopefully uh, we can trust them, uh, we'll test them and see, but it, it certainly makes it seem like uh, we don't have to worry about replacing them no matter how old they look, because it's already been done internally. Uh, the one final uh, thing that has to be fixed, I think, before we can start testing this circuit is to install a proper three-wire grounded power cord. Now I discuss this with the owner because we want to preserve the originality of this amp, but let's face it, this old brown uh, zip cord may or may not be original, and we know that the plug is an add-on at the end of that cord, so what we settled on was one of those really nice brown rayon covered three wire uh, power cords like I used on the Oahu amp in the previous video. So uh, let's pause for a second while I call the company and uh, order uh, one of those cords. Here we go. Uh, hello Grand Brass Lamp Parts uh, this is Uncle Doug and Jack, and we need one of your brown rayon covered three wire power cords. Okay, and we need it in a hurry. Okay, keep watching this space. And boom, there it is. How is that for quick service? Okay, and uh, there is the company that sent it to us. Uh, I put a link in the video description of the Oahu. Uh, video. I'll put a link in this one also in case you want to get one of these power cords. They're really a nice touch on the very early amps like this one. Well, they don't fool around with the packaging. There's about four acres of white paper protecting uh, the cords. I ordered two because the shipping's pretty high. It's close to, what, $18 or so, and it's $12 per cord. So if you order one cord, it's $30. Might as well order two while you're at it to sort of amortize that high shipping cost. But I'll tell you, they really did get it here quickly and securely. Well, here's the cord. Uh, just beautiful, as the previous one was. The one drawback that I see is it's, the cord is 12 feet long. Okay, it's, This is a lamp parts company, and I guess that makes sense on a lamp. But when the cord is about the same size as the amp chassis, I think it's time to maybe cut this back down to a more usable length, like six or seven feet. Okay, you've got to admit, uh, 
that's a whole lot of cord for this little chassis. And here is the installed three wire power cord. Uh, the black wire comes up here to the surface mount fuse. The other end of the fuse goes to one of the uh, wires going to the uh, primary winding of the power transformer. White wire comes over here to an unused lug on the rectifier socket and uh, it is there connected to the other uh, primary uh, winding wire. Uh, the green wire comes over here and is soldered to the uh, ground lug on a tube socket which in turn is soldered to the chassis. I put a drop of super glue to keep the cord from pulling out of the, that very snug grommet and uh, I cut down to about six feet of wire so that it doesn't completely overpower the chassis of the little amp. Another uh, discovery is this unused wire which I feel is the center tap from the 6.3 volt filament uh, circuit. Um, they took the inexpensive way of wiring the filaments in which as you see up here the other large green wire comes over to the two 6.3 volt filament pins uh, and the uh, other side of the filament circuit is simply grounded and the second 6.3 volt winding is grounded also. So the chassis then is half of the filament winding circuit. When you do that you can't ground the center tap and they didn't. They just left it here loose. Well, list of final review. Uh, all of the capacitors have been replaced and they've done so in a very painstaking manner in which each of the new caps has been uh, concealed within the body of the old original capacitors. Second, all of the resistors have been tested. Many were way out of spec and have been replaced with period correct carbon comp resistors. Finally, a new three-wire power cord has been installed that grounds the chassis and it has a brown rayon covered uh, exterior which is in keeping with the age of the amplifier. Now let's turn it over and plug in the tubes including that vintage 6V6 that we're going to use instead of the 6K6 which is a lower output tube that came with the amp. All right, the chassis has been reinstalled back in the cabinet. Uh, after doing so, I checked to make sure there are no bare wires anywhere near metal, no possible shorts in the harness that connects the electrodynamic speaker to the uh, amp circuit. I installed a Eurotubes uh, bias probe between the 6V6 and the tube socket. Uh, the original two tubes that came with the amp, a 6SJ7 and a 5Y3, are both installed. I think we're ready now to plug uh, the amp into the current limiter, uh, turn it on and inject some tones to see uh, what type of volume we're getting uh, and the clarity of amplification. Okay, we're all set up to go. I have a 500 cycle per second tone uh, being sent into the amplifier circuit. That's a, a a rather tolerable tone. I think we can stand it. I've turned the attenuator and amplitude down to uh, zero because recall we have no on off switch. We have no volume control. So uh, whatever is put in will receive 100% amplification. So we have to be very careful we don't damage our speaker. So uh, with that in mind then I will plug in this uh, the three wire power cord into the current limiter which is the same as turning the on off switch on and uh, we'll watch the tubes light up and see what kind of amplification and tone we get. I'm afraid we'll have to delay our amplifier testing uh, for about seven hours while the neighbors leaf blowing technicians pollute the neighborhood with dust and pollen. Okay so please be patient. Well I believe the droning of the leaf blowers has finally subsided after only six and a half hours so let's go ahead and plug in the amp and see what we find. First off nice high B plus 470 okay now it'll drop as the uh, 6v6 begins to conduct current um, 
boy, I'll tell you, that plate current looks about perfect. I'm so glad I doubled the value of that bias resistor. We'd probably be up around 40 milliamps otherwise. But let's see, we've got 34.2 and uh, 263 volts. Uh, that's going to be almost exactly 9 watts of plate dissipation, which I think is ideal for this older circuit. We know the maximum is 12, so this is safely under that. Uh, it will understress the power transformer and the circuit, as well as the 6V6. We've got a little bit of a power hum. It's not unpleasant. Now let's crank up the attenuator where we will get some output and then oh my lord I'm just off a of zero on the amplitude. Wow the volume is astounding. Look at this. I'm just off a of zero. That's the uh, indicator line right there. And it's already loud enough that it's getting unpleasant. I can't even make it up to a quarter turn. So the volume is really uh, impressive. Nice and clean. One thing I do notice is that uh, 6SJ7, extremely microphonic. You know, that's not unusual for 6SJ7s. You know, I'm going to go check my stash and see if I can't find one that's less microphonic. I worry about this because that's pretty significant. Okay, uh, one other thing is I'd like to try the circuit with a 6K6 uh, that it uh, came with. When I say came with, I mean as it came uh, to the workshop, not as it came from the factory. It appears on the schematics that the output tube was originally a 6V6, but who knows? The 6K6 might, might sound fine also. So uh, we'll give a, a little audio test to a 6K6 as well, and you all can decide what you like better. Meanwhile, let's try to solve that um, 6SJ7. Listen to that. Hear the pinging? The uh, microphonic tendencies of the 6SJ7 that's in the amp. Okay, I've replaced that glass envelope a 6SJ7 with a NOS Sylvania metal bodied 6SJ7. Let's see if uh, the microphonic tendencies have been uh, diminished. Wow, what a difference. It's essentially dead quiet now. I get a tiny bit of microphonic acoustic feedback but nothing like it was. Uh, I think this tube was responsible both for the background noise, the uh, sort of power hum that it had, and also for the microphonic uh, tendencies. So uh, I think we'll put this one in the box and this brand new tube will go with the amp. Much better. And boy does it amplify. Wonderful volume. Well, I think we solved two problems. It's always nice. So uh, let's uh, try a little guitar music through this jewel. Longtime viewers will recall Jack's favorite trick of hiding under any cloth that he can crawl under uh, in order to earn treats for his cleverness. Um, and as you can see in his old age, uh, he's gotten a little lazy, like a lot of us and uh, only partially hides under the rug, uh, still expecting, of course, the same treats, which he gets because in my old age I've become even more gullible than usual. So, be patient, Jack. I'll go get the treats and reward you. Well, looks like we're ready for our audio demonstration of the mighty 1946 Princeton amp. Uh, I've got the SM57 aimed uh, the best I can at a unobstructed portion of the speaker cone. Uh, what I'm going to do is use digitally recorded guitar music and we're going to first hear a tune with the 6V6 then the 6K6. 
then I'll do that again, 6v6, uh, 6k6 with a second tune, and then the last four will all be with the 6v6. Okay, so if that's clear, let's get started. I'm just beginning to edit the little Princeton uh, audio demo, and as you can see, here are the seven 6v6 tunes. Here are the seven identical 6k6 tunes. All conditions the same except for the difference in output tube. And you see how much greater the amplitude is from 6v6 than from 6k6. Now, what I will do to make the comparison uh, fair uh, is I'm going to uh, now go in and amplify all of these tunes so that their amplitude is exactly the same as the 6v6 so that it would be a fair comparison. But as you can see, the output power of the 6v6 is definitely greater.
Now that we've heard the audio demo, I thought it might be interesting to discuss the three different models of Woody Fender amps that really were the very first amplifiers ever built by Fender Electric Instruments. Rumor has it that they were Woody's because uh, Fender was making uh, lap steel guitars at the time and he got a load of rather expensive hardwood in that was too thin for use uh, on the instruments themselves so he decided to use that wood uh, there's maple and mahogany and oak um, and he wanted to actually use that to build uh, the amplifier cabinet so that it wouldn't go to waste which definitely sounds just like something Leo would do these Woody amps were all produced from 1946 to around the middle of 1947 and uh, they were all purely point-to-point -point construction. There were no circuit boards uh, during uh, this period of time. The first model is the one that was featured in our video. It is the Princeton. Uh, it was considered to be a student model. Uh, three tubes, single-ended, featuring a 6V6 output tube six watts of power which I think was kind of optimistic two equal inputs uh, an 8 inch Jensen electrodynamic speaker no controls whatsoever as we saw in the video and it evolved or became a uh, the TV front Tweed Princeton uh, around 1948 the second model uh, is called the Deluxe uh, also known as the Model 26. Of the three, it's the only one that had a model designation like that. What's kind of amusing is on the professionals, they use the uh, same uh, instrument panel and actually scratched off the Model 26 from its instrument panel. So you see they were, really this was a grassroots organization at that time. Okay, the Deluxe uh, is the second uh, of the uh, and a little bit more sophisticated of the Woody amps. Five tubes double ended with uh, six V6s in a push pull configuration for uh, around 14 watts of output power. Again, probably a little bit optimistic. There were three inputs two for instruments, one for microphone, one 10 inch Jensen electrodynamic speaker and it actually had controls okay three of them and they were labeled from 1 to 12 which is kind of amusing um, there was the instrument uh, volume the microphone volume and there was a combination tone and on off uh, switch um, they became the TV front tweed deluxe amps which everybody swoons over and pays outrageous amounts for Finally was the ultimate of them all, the professional or just plain pro amp. Uh, this was special order only. At the time, I guess Fender didn't think there was a big market for them, so he didn't make a bunch uh, to have in stock. Okay, there were six tubes, apparently one extra level of uh, preamplification, uh, double-ended, and instead of six V6s, it went with six L6s, for again a slightly optimistic 25 watt output. The inputs were the same, three uh, total, a two instrument, one uh, microphone. This stepped up though to a 15 inch Jensen electrodynamic speaker. The controls were essentially the same as they were in the deluxe. And the professional uh, turned into uh, the V front super and also the dual professional which we saw uh, on a video that I posted uh, several months ago. It had two 10 inch speakers. So uh, that's it. Uh, as you can see uh, Fender got off to a rather simple and basic start with just three models that covered all the bases and uh, they went from there. Okay so I hope this uh, is informative. I created this chart because when you start reading all this, it gets so confusing uh, in uh, sort of a text format. So I thought that direct comparisons like this uh, would be helpful. And I hope you agree. Well, I guess that about does it on this video extravaganza for the mighty 1946 Fender Princeton Woody Amp.
As usual, I want to thank all my PayPal contributors and Patreon patrons for their generosity during the last month to keep us on the air and, as far as I'm concerned, advertising free. If you would like to join them, uh, please uh, see the links in the video description which will enable you to do so. I also wanted to thank Michael at Shelley Amps uh, for sending that fantastic uh, capacitor tester. As I said, uh, what I'll do is uh, use it and a couple other methods of testing caps and make a technical video in which we can see uh, which of these devices seems to be the most uh, practical and reliable. And I want to thank all our subscribers and our faithful viewers out there in uh, YouTube land. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and correspond with you. Uh, and I hope you'll stay tuned. We have another video uh, underway already, and it should be out in, uh, say, two or three weeks. Okay, so stay tuned. We'll see you then. Bye for now.